Hello everyone, Jeff here again. Today we're going to show you how to quickly and cheaply remodel your old 1970s bathroom. So you can see here, this is a bathroom that was put in. Uh, this building was built, I guess, in the early early 70s. And you can tell uh, that kind of yellow stuff was popular back then. So the 1970s called and they want their bathroom back and we're going to give it to them. So we're basically going to show you how to quickly uh, gut this bathroom here. What we're going to do today is we're going to remove out this vanity here, that you see here, and we're going to uh, remove the toilet, and then we're going to strip off all of this linoleum, and then we're going down to put, put new tile down real quick, and we're going to put a new vanity right back on top of this. We're going to remove this old style mirror. And here we're going to remove this medicine cabinet and replace it with a new one. This thing is just bleh. It's dated and ugly. And lastly, we'll put in a nice fixture here. And you should be able to do all of this yourself for uh, under a thousand dollars. The vanity that's going to go here, uh, this is only a 24 inch wide unit here. So this is going to be about a, a $200 special from Home Depot. Um, we'll put an American Standard. Um, Champion 4 toilet will go here, elongated, we'll put an elongated, a little bigger toilet, and um, that's about $200, and then, uh, let's see, we'll put a new faucet on there, would be about 50 all the hoses together should be about 20 bucks. and the new valves are going to go on the wall in the back there underneath, um, as you can see, I've already done that, I've already put the new valves on there, and you can see they had the old copper pipes there, and those are going to come down. Um, we'll replace those with the stainless steel hoses. We'll tidy up and with a new P-trap. And we'll get the show rolling here. So I'm looking here in the shower. So this was a foreclosed unit. And in here you can see they've already uh, done some recent work. We don't know when this was done, probably a few years back, but it does look in pretty good shape. So we're not going to touch that. What we might do is get some type of tile that will match either the tile on the floor there or maybe something that will match the wall, maybe a lighter gray type of a tile, a little bit more modern look. Anything's going to be better than this linoleum. And you can expect this linoleum to be a pain to, to pull up. And you can also expect it to be multiple layers as well. And we'll have to deal with that. And then we'll scrape off all of the, the whatever we can from the adhesive. Okay, so as we start with the mirror here, I usually like to use a utility knife and I come along and score down the side and the top of the mirror because people tend to paint up against these things and that will act like glue or sometimes people will caulk on them and you want to get rid of all the caulk as well. And I always like to wear gloves. It's a good idea to tape up and put eyewear on because you never know what if it shatters and comes flying at you. So <clears throat> my tool of choice is usually one of these and you just go behind it a little bit, try to work it out a little. Typically they'll put these things on with about five or six globs of black glue on the back. So all you want to do is just gently slide behind it and, and pull it out in certain parts. See how it's coming really loose there? And you just work it gently without breaking the mirror. It just comes right off. Right off the wall. Okay. And you can see what was there. There was only a few globs of adhesive here and there. That's all there was to it. <clears throat> now as for your medicine cabinet, you're going to have to get a utility knife and score all of this caulk down along here. Probably along the bottom and probably along the top as well. See? Otherwise this will never come out. And typically these are held in with four screws. There's one there on this and one down here. And you will see two others on the other side here. There's one up top there and one down there. Once you unscrew all four of those, you'll be done. You just pull it out. 
And when you go to put your new one in, you may have to make your hole bigger, but you always want to measure your cavity here, measure the opening and make sure that you know what the dimensions are of your new medicine cabinet. Will it fit in that opening? Will I have to carve a bigger opening? Do I have room to cut a bigger opening if I need to? You know, what if there was electrical wires running right up here? Am I going to be able to go up if I need to go up? Am I going to be able to go sideways if I need to go sideways? So those are the things you want to uh, look at once you pull this out. Then looking down here at the uh, switch and the outlets, this is all going to get replaced. We're replacing this with a modern uh, Decora switch. And we're going to replace these here with a more modern uh, outlet as well. And we have to change it to a ground fall, a GFCI outlet, as required by code. Because anytime you're within about six feet of water, you have to have a protected outlet. So this is not a protected outlet. And we have to fix that according to building codes. And then also to remove your backsplash and side splashes, you also have to take your utility knife here and score it along there. And that will enable you to get behind it and pry it off of the wall. So typically when I do demo work, I use a variety of different tools. I have all sorts of you know, hammers that I use and different sizes of these little uh, crowbars, demo bars. And, um, so sometimes you use like the real thin uh, taping knives here to get you into the little cracks to get you started then you can pull it out big enough to get your big boy in there and then you just pull it off the wall and you want to try not to kill the drywall at the same time you don't want to poke any holes through the drywall so you just do it gently you know? so you can see how easily we pull that out and then we'll do the same thing on the back well, we hope you're finding this video useful so far, and if you have, we'd appreciate it if you give us a thumbs up down below, and be sure to click on that subscribe button down there too. And when you do that, make sure you click the little bell icon next to it. That will alert you every time we upload a new video, because with all of these remodeling videos we have, I guarantee you don't want to miss a single one. So we got this guy off the wall now. And uh, by the way, I'm a firm believer in not just throwing stuff into the landfill. So we are going to put this on Craigslist, and there will be somebody that wants this, believe it or not, for 10 bucks. They'll either throw it in a mobile home or use it as a second sink out in their, their garage. But we've sold these every time we've done it. I don't believe in throwing anything in the landfill. And then you got to remember, you got to come by with your utility knife and get all the way up here on this because that's sealed to the wall there and it's also sealed to the wall over there as well so you will not be able to pull the vanity off the wall until you get those done okay now here under the sink by code you have to screw it to the wall so you can see that's where the screw is right there we'll have to undo that screw right there and then we're going to cut the drain pipe we have a special uh, PVC saw that's made out of a metal string, and we'll show you in a minute. But we'll cut it right here. So that just the straight pipe will be sticking out of the wall, and then we'll be able to slide everything straight out. We'll have to cut openings around. There's already an opening there. We'll make it a little bigger to get that valve out of there. And same thing with the other side. And then we'll be ready to pull the sink out. So this is our PVC saw here. Now it may not look, with this wire here, it may not look uh, according to your convention of what a saw should look like, but that's what it is. It's a tight metal string that has these sharp edges that dig into the PVC pipe. And you can see we already cut it right there. Cut it all the way through. It only takes about a minute and a half. So now we've got everything separated and we're ready to pull the vanity out. All right, so we have removed the vanity, and you can see there's just a little bit of mold along the back there. So we went ahead and sprayed it with some of the mold control, and we also sprayed the back of the vanity as well to make sure we neutralize it. Now, one of the things that you'll find a lot with these older bathrooms that were built in the 60s, 70s, or whatever, 
I don't know why builders were really stupid back then, but if you look, see this just barely fits through the 24 inch door opening, so we had to take the door off, and we do this a lot, we always have to remove the door in the older houses. The newer ones that were built in the 80s and above, they tend to give you 30 inch doors in the bathroom, which I think are much better. So if you're having a, a house that's custom built, you might want to check with your builder and ask them if they can give you a 30 or 36 inch door into your bathrooms. You do not want a 24 inch door. They're just tiny anyway. But you can see what we were left with here. Not a big deal, but sometimes it can be a, a pain trying to take these doors off the hinges here. Uh, because what happens is people paint over the hinges. So let me show you this door over here. See, they paint right over the hinges, and sometimes that can make it difficult to remove your screws. All right, so here, you can see we've cleaned everything out, we've swept everything out. I usually do that immediately, as soon as I pull out the, um, the vanity. I usually like to sweep the floor out and everything. Now, one thing, um, let me point out just a couple of items here. So here's our linoleum floor, and you can see there's already another layer below it, so we know we've got at least two layers of linoleum to pull up. And probably what we may end up doing with this wall, since the builder damaged it too when they were putting in the, uh, the vanity, what we're going to do is probably cut a piece of drywall right here, just to eliminate all of this stuff here, just start with all brand new. And so this is a standard one and a half inch drain line that comes out of the, uh, the wall in most bathrooms. And as soon as you cut this pipe and you remove the sink, guess what? You just remove the trap and the trap is what had the water in it that kept all the sewer gases from coming up in your house. So depending on where you are, it won't take but a minute before you start smelling it. It's just really bad sewer gas. So you always want to plug it off. Um, you know, some people do it with a paper towel, some people use a cloth. Um, we also like to use these. This is a one and a half inch PVC cap. So we just take that and stick it right on there. And now we're capped off. We don't have to worry about the gases anymore. Okay, and just a reminder, like I said, make sure you're always wearing gloves, eyewear when you're taking down the stuff. Uh, wear eye protection and wear a mask. Now I'm going to put my mask back on in a second. I just took it off just to uh, so you can hear me more clearer here. Uh, but this definitely is it's a green mold. I've sprayed it and we're probably going to spray it again just to help neutralize it and we'll just slice it up and get this drywall off of the wall and we'll put new drywall down. Yeah. Well, guess what? This fooled us. We thought the yellow here was linoleum. It felt and looked just like linoleum until we got down here and looked. It's actually tile, so we've already started chipping it up. And then it's on top of this linoleum here. And what I like about this is this comes up real easy, see? So once we chip off the tiles, these will come right up. Maybe we'll even try to slide under it and pull them up. And there won't be any mortar stuck on the floor to have to grind down, which is even better. This is much better than we uh, hoped. For this kind of tile. So here's the result of about an hour or so of work, maybe less. So we basically just took our 5-in-1 tool and chiseled underneath wherever we saw the linoleum and it would pull the tile up with it. So here's a closer look at it. So we just kind of went like this, under it like that. But we still have to chisel here and there, so it does take a little bit of time, but it's not hard work at all because once it clears up, boy, it looks really clean there. Once we vacuum this, we'll be ready to tile right onto it. Well, we finally completed the removal of all the tiles and the linoleum uh, tiles that were on underneath them. And uh, we really lucked out here because thank God that whoever did the installation in the first place did such a poor job. You can see they hardly put any adhesive down at all. Only when you see the orange here, that's pretty much where they had adhesive. And so we were able to get most of it to come up pretty quickly. 
and then we have a nice smooth surface. We don't have to diamond grind down the floor at all. So now we can just tile right on it. So our next step here is to remove the toilet here. Now the toilets, there's only a couple of things you got to do first. One, you got to turn off the valve, the water there, and then you flush the toilet, and there's still going to be to uh, toilet water left in the tank and in here, and you can suck that out with a um, with your shop vac, or you can just you know put it on a little flatbed cart. We usually use a little cart and just wheel it out, and hopefully it doesn't drain too much water. Uh, you might want to put a paper or cardboard down because once you lift this off the ground, there's going to be that wax ring on there, and it gets a little gooey. So really all you do is you have to unscrew this nut right here on this side and the other nut on the other side and that's usually all that's holding the toilet down unless you have any caulking that you might have to um, scrape around but we don't need that here because they just tiled right up to it and didn't caulk or anything. So let's go ahead and get that done. A lot of times with the older cabinets, they might be an inch or two smaller than today's cabinets. So these cabinet blocks that they put here under the cement block wall for you to screw the back of your cabinet into, they're too low. So we have to put two more and then we're gonna use concrete anchors, tap cons, to screw them a block there and a block there because the new cabinets are likely to be up here at the 34 inch mark, from 34 inches down to about 32 inches along the back of the cabinet there's usually a strip of wood or something that you can run a screw through it and into the board. So you have to have that there. So we will also add that as well. All right, so we are now ready to begin tiling and here's a sample of our tile. They're gonna be 12 by 24. And so what we have to do to prepare the floor is we have to cut the bottoms of these door jams to allow the tile to slide underneath when you're tiling. And, you, well, how deep do you need it to be? Well, that's the, the burning question there. And you want to make sure you don't cut off too much of this, otherwise you'll be left with an embarrassing gap above your tile. So a good rule of thumb is this is a 5 16 inch porcelain tile that we're using here. And we're going to trowel a quarter of an inch trowel under it, a comb, comb pattern that's a quarter of an inch. And by the time you mush the tile down on it, it flattens it down to about an eighth of an inch, which is about how thick a cardboard box is. So a good rule of thumb is, is you take the tile and put it on a piece of cardboard and trace your line right there and that's how much you have to cut off of the bottom, see, like that. But with the amount that I do with all of my tile jobs, I use this big old electric jam saw. This is a door jam saw that was made specifically for making this cut at the bottom of the thing and as you can see here, since it's electronic, it's gonna go pretty quick. You just go right up against it. And so probably in about 10 seconds, each door jam is done. So this is made for using volume and accurate work. And the way it works is you set the blade height here according to how high your tile sits on the cardboard. So we'll have to raise this blade here a little bit and make sure that we have adequate clearance. And that's all you do. You just go ahead and cut the door jams. So you see how easy this tool makes it? And what I like about it, it has a port that goes right to your vacuum, your shop vac, so that way there's no dust. You're just in and out and done in two seconds. See that cut cleanly in there? Now let's take our tile. Now it slides right under there. So, and give just a little bit for some margin of error, in case we need to go a little thicker with the uh, thin set. Normally with a 12 inch by 24 inch tile that we're going to use, I prefer to do a one half inch trowel. But the problem we have here is we need to make this floor up against an existing ceramic floor that was made out of cheap quarter inch thick ceramic and they hardly put any thin set down. So we need to be up to that without any lippage. So that's why we're going to be coming back over here doing this. 
using a quarter inch trowel and we'll back butter the tiles to make sure we have good adhesion to it. Well, you can see we've dry fitted all of the 12 by 24 tiles here. And you can see we had to cut them to fit around the door jams there. So this all took about an hour and a half. Believe it or not, it does take a lot of time to make some of these cuts, especially the angled ones that have to fit under the door jams. So this is now ready for thin set. We're going to go ahead and mix up our mortar and start tiling. And just quickly, I wanted to show you the type of thin set we're using. We're using what I call a LHT, which, is, which means large and heavy tiles. So whenever I'm using 12 by 24s, I use this type of mortar and I mix it just slightly on the dry side. That way the tiles won't, they won't sink down in there. Uh, it's an anti-sagging formula. Um, so there's a number of manufacturers that have these, but I get this and make sure that it says uh, polymer modified thin set on there. So see it's got with the polymer on there. So that helps it adhere better to the, the cement substrate that we are putting this on. Now if you were putting this onto something like Schluter or Curdy board or something that's completely watertight, you wouldn't be able to use this. You'd have to use um, something without the polymer in there. You'd have to use a non-modified thin set. But this one right here, you'll see right on there, it says on there, non-sag formula for large format heavy tile and stone. Okay, so this is what we're going to use here. And you can see on the back of the bag is their diagram there that shows you you can use it on the floors or on the walls or on a bench. And then outside you can also use it if you want to put it outside you can use it on the floor and on the walls only. Alright, so I've keyed in the first batch here to do the first row of tiles, right? So they, we call this keying it in. This is where you you just kind of do a quick skim coat of the mortar and now we're going to trowel it into our trowel lines. And I'm using a quarter inch trowel here and you just put it in here, drag it at about a 45 degree angle all the way across. I'm going real slow just to show you. Now if you look at my trowel lines, what do you notice about them? They're all perfectly parallel. Okay. So I don't ever want to see you guys doing this. This is what I see all the time on uh, on TV. Watch this. You guys go like this. You think it looks cool because they made a circle. Okay. This is not the way to do this. The reason why you never want to do this is because the air has nowhere to go and these will never collapse down. The whole idea of tiling is you put the tile down on top of the mortar and it collapses down these grooves, see? But see, if the air has nowhere to go, these will not collapse. It's 100% impossible to collapse. So I, I get so mad when I see all these flipping shows, they bring in their floor contractors and these guys have no clue how to key in mortar whatsoever. It's all gotta be parallel. Otherwise the air won't collapse out and the air shoots out the end. So that's how you do that, okay? Make sure you do it that way. Do not curve your trowel lines. So here's my first tile, and you can see I back buttered it. And the reason why we do this is to make sure that mortar has made contact with pretty much 100%. Now the Tile Council of North America pretty much tells you 85 to 95%. I like to go for 100% myself, just to make sure I have everything covered there. So that when I put this down onto this troweled out mortar right here and it all mashes down it'll all stick all over here I can't tell you how many times I've pulled up old tile jobs and seen where the the mortar never made it into the little square cells see how you can still see a little bit right there if the mortar doesn't make it into there how's it gonna hold the tile in place it's not so once you have your tile down you want to move it side to side and mash it down a little bit you want to make sure those bridges collapse down right and you'll, you want to make sure that you're, you're level side to side this way and I also will turn it this way too. Make sure the entire tile is level in both directions because every other tile in this room is going to be set according to this. This is our cornerstone piece. I often use multiple spirit levels just to make sure, you know. 
So we always want to make sure we're level. Okay, so you can see what I do is I usually take my finger or a knife and just kind of remove that last little bit right there in between each tile so that it doesn't ooze up in between the tiles when I place the next one. And then you can see I'm using these little spacers here. This is my tile leveling system here. And the way this works is, you can see I've kind of got one, a wedge in there just to show you how it works. But when you put the next tile in, you'll run this wedge in between, tighten them down with a little plier tool there, and it makes sure that these two tiles are completely in plane with one another. They've got to be at the exact same level with no lippage, zero lippage. It's especially important in the bathroom and especially important around the toilet where you can't have any tiles next to each other even slightly crooked or anything because when you put that toilet down it will rock back and forth and you're going to end up doing a lot of shimming trying to balance that toilet and that's uh, the number probably the number one mistake I see a lot of people make when they tile in the bathrooms because then they have a wiggly toilet because of that so here you can see a little better what I was talking about here so it makes sure that these two tiles are at exactly the same level so, once I go ahead and tighten this down, this wedge in with the tool, it makes it go click, 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 click. You'll see that the levels will completely match up and they'll be perfect. Okay, so here's our first course all put down. And all of our tile leveling wedges are in place here. And you can see you're nice and perfect level. The way you tell your level, too, is when you put this thing down, your level here, you shouldn't see any gaps under it. It should be just perfect. It should smack down perfect and it shouldn't rock. There's no rocking left to right on this, right? And here's the next one here. Every piece you put down, you have to check for level. So there it is, level there. And you always check both directions on level there. And then there's the, the last piece up against the wall there. So then we put the clips in here for the next course of tile that we're going to lay down next to this. And let's start troweling out some more mortar. All right, so here we are. We're progressing nicely here across the room. Everything's nice and flat on the surface there. And you'll notice as I get going, I like to make sure that all my mortar gets combed to the short distance. It's a lot easier to force all of the air out of a shorter distance than it is, you know, the length of the tile. So that's just something I do to make life a little easier for us. And you can see what I like to do also is I'll force a little of the mortar right up to the edge of each tile underneath and then wall it off so it's nice and straight. That way I know I have 100% coverage right up to the end of the tile. Here we are the next day. Everything's all nice and dry. And you can see we have a nice flat floor here. All we have to do now is to just knock off all these guys here which we do with a rubber mallet. You just give them a good bang and they go flying off. Sometimes you have a few chunks that you have to deal with, but for the most part, that's how they come off, just like that. All right, now that the flooring is in here, I'm turning my attention back over here to securing this hot water pipe. So you can see here we tap conned in with a copper strap and now it's tight. I mean, it's not even moving at all. And before you saw it was banging back and forth. The last thing in the world you want, folks, is a loose pipe in the wall because this joint right here is at risk for cracking, breaking, or whatever. And the last thing you want is a leak inside your wall when you're putting in all brand new stuff, right? So then I came back over here to this one and I put a tap on in here where the builder originally didn't have anything at all there. So this was loose before, now it's nice and tight. It's perfectly tight. They already had one anchor here, but there was nothing on the other side. So who knows, maybe it was late Friday afternoon, it was beer 30, the guy wanted to get out of there, who knows, but of course it always falls on our hands to fix it, doesn't it? Well, we already got the first piece of drywall on, uh, we actually ran out of drywall, we didn't have a full size piece, so we're just going to do it with two smaller pieces, no big deal. It actually makes it a little easier for you when you have to drill all these holes, because I only need to drill one hole in this piece and then I'll drill these two holes in the other piece of drywall. And this is always a good time to take pictures of what's behind your wall so that you'll know later on when you're putting more drywall in and where you can put screws and where you can't. Okay, so now when we're grounding, uh, everybody has their own favorite method. Um, I like to just apply it right to where the grout line is. And the idea is to come across at a 45 degree angle 
to force it into the grout line there and then scrape it all away. Um, some people will dump the grout out all over the floor and to me that's just a waste because the grout only needs to go where the grout line is and nowhere else, see? So I always just kind of put it in like that. And the proper method really to disperse the grout once it's in there is you want to come at a 45 degree angle across the line. Because if you just drag straight up the line, all you're going to do is drag the grout right back out of the line. Alright, so I've completed the grouting here. And I've just done my initial wipe and molding and shaping of the grout lines with the sponge. We're going to let this dry off about an hour or so and give it a chance to set up. And then I'm going to come by with just a very, very lightly damp sponge to get off whatever little bit of haze might be left. I usually try to get do a good job of getting most of that up when I am sponging it and molding it into place here initially because um, you, you definitely don't want to leave any of this haze on there. Uh, sometimes it does, just doesn't want to come off. So I always try to be proactive and get it off ahead of time. So we'll check back in an hour. Here's a little trick that I use that I'm going to pass on to you. When you're sponging off the tile, I usually use one tile, okay, one sponge per tile. I don't swirl it around all over the place because all you're going to do is be mixing around more mud, okay, and, and all you're going to do is keep redepositing the haze onto the floor. So what I do is this. I go one stroke like that, then I flip the sponge over, see there's a little bit of grout on there, and I go one more down like that. See? Then I take the edge and go on to the next tile. Just go to the end. And don't let it touch the grout line when you get to the end. You don't want to re-wet the grout and keep mixing more in. So then you flip to the other long edge of the sponge and just come right along here. Now you have two more ends. You got the short end there and the short end there that are still clean. So now you can come over to the next tile and you go there and then you flip it around one more time and drag it all the way almost to the end there and that's how you clean it see so now there's a lot less grout coming off on the sponge and we're doing a lot better job of cleaning it and so we'll rinse back into the bucket of the clean water come back and do the next tile and that is the best way to clean off all of the grout residue well we finally have the new vanity hooked up here and uh, what you can see we did here was we replaced the 24 inch vanity with a 30 inch vanity. Uh, by doing so, we're violating code by two inches, but you know, uh, so what? The, when the builder built this place, they only left 13 inches from the center of the toilet to the shower there. So theoretically, you're supposed to have 15 inches is what most uh, places require. Uh, so we're gonna have 15 on this side and we're only gonna have 13 on this side. So, not too bad, and uh, it looks a lot better anyway to have that extra uh, six inches in, in size there, especially for that counter there. And the newer toilet that we're putting in over here, that's the, uh, the Champion 4 there, that's a tall and skinny toilet. It's not the big fat wide ones like, like the old style, like the one we pulled out of here. That was the original, it was a low seater. This one sits up a little higher. And by making the, the tanks taller and skinnier, it also gives them more force when the, when the thing flushes. That's why they say here that it'll flush a bucket of uh, golf ball. Right. So underneath the sink here, you can see your hot water on the left, cold water on the right, and there's your drain going out to the street right there in the middle. And so to attach to that, what I normally do is I will use this piece here, this is called a trap adapter, one and a half inch trap adapter. So this is made to be cemented directly onto that stub of uh, street drain pipe leading out there, that's the waistline. And then the front end of this will made up with our trap here. So the trap is gonna go right into the, into that adapter once we get it all cemented in place. This will slide right into it. I'm going to come up top side here for a second to show you this. So that's what it looks like. It'll plug into it on the left there and it'll come out of the wall and then this would normally go, I'll show you here, 
will normally go right into that tailpipe. Problem is that tailpipe is up a little high. So what we're going to do is use an extender piece here. This is a tailpipe extender piece. Now if you look closely at the, end, the tip of that uh, drain line there, you can see I put primer on there, that purple stripe there around the edge. Whenever you're going to cement two pieces together, you always want to use primer. I put it into both the piece that's going to cement on and to the pipe itself. And the reason why it's purple is so that you can see that it's there. You know, so when the inspectors come, they'll be able to easily tell that you did indeed put primer on when you cemented the two together. I see too many people that do this and don't use the primer, and that's a big no-no. You're just asking for trouble. All right, so here we just stick the tube in there, and eventually we'll, we'll tighten this down all the way, but I just want to leave everything kind of loose so we can dry fit and see what has to go where. All right, so the extension tube, um, you got to put the, the nut on first, then the green gasket here, and you notice how the, the ledge is up, the flat part is facing up, so that this angled part can slip down inside and seal that up there where the extension tube meets the downspout there, the tailpipe. And then you just screw it in nice and tight there, and a few seconds later, that's what we've done. Now here you can see I've already put the nut on here first too, and there's that gasket. And I'm just going to force it down on top of it and start screwing this piece in. So now we have everything all ready to go. I'm just going to um, do a little tightening before we test it for water. And every time before I turn on my faucet, the very first time when I put a new faucet in, you always want to take off the aerator and flush out whatever's in the lines there. You never want to have whatever's clogged in that line to go in your aerator and clog up that nice filter of yours. Okay, now there's just one more test that I want to do here, and that is to test the LED on my faucet. This is an LED faucet here. See how it turns on there? You get a little water flow. Let me, let me turn off the light here so you can see what it does. What's really cool about this is that in the dark, you can see it better. It shines a spotlight of LED on the water, and the, kind of the water kind of glows a little bit. This is a really cool feature. And this is controlled by a little turbine inside the head here. There's no batteries or anything. It's just strictly running off of natural uh, water turbulence. We put our new closet bolts in and tighten down the nuts just to hold them secure there. And these nuts will hold them tight to the position that they're in. Um, just enough for you to get the, the toilet to fit down over them. Now it's important to make sure that these are exactly at the 9 o'clock and 3 o'clock positions of the clock. Otherwise your toilet could be tilted one way or the other. It's got to be completely facing straight out. And then um, you can see I've been using these uh, Cena seal gaskets now for the last few years. I don't use wax rings anymore. These work a lot better and they're easier to, to deal with. Plus, if you ever have to lift up your toilet or reseat it or something, um, you don't have to buy another wax ring. You just reuse this thing. So it's cleaner, it's nicer. And let's go ahead and install the toilet. So here you can see we got the toilet in. Fastened down with these bigger plastic nuts now, which I really like. It's not going to be any corrosion ever. And here's those wonderful white caps I told you about that everybody should be using. Okay. And you can see in the back here, we had just a little bit of curvature. Sometimes you get a little curvature from the toilet, from the manufacturer. So I put one of my little blue spacers under there to help keep it nice and sturdy. So now when we come back out here and check, can't even wiggle it at all. I think it's perfect. It's just rock solid. And we put one on the other side too. So what we will do is we will come back later on with our little Dremel tool and just slice the part that's sticking out. And then we're going to caulk around the bottom. All right, so I wanted to show you something. Do you notice anything that looks a little peculiar about this picture here? 
Well, you can see we mounted our light. I knew it was going to be way offset anyway, because, you know, sometimes builders just do really stupid things. And this is one such case. This is one where we see this quite a bit. They just don't know how to center the can for a light over the vanity. Now, this one looks like it's only 12 inches off the wall, maybe not even 12 inches. So, but anyway, especially with the type of light we're using, you're not going to get away with that. So we now have to look at moving this light over about maybe six inches or so to the right. Okay, so let's quickly review here how much we've spent here and just what we've remodeled in this part of the bathroom. And remember, we only remodeled everything outside of the shower. We didn't need to remodel inside the shower because the previous owner had already done it and we don't know when, but it looks pretty decent and it did not need to be remodeled. So if we pan down here, we can look and see here, this was our big ticket items here, was the vanity. The vanity here was $500. And as we look down there, even further, we can see the toilet there was $250. And then further down here on the floor, we can see this is about $40 worth of tile. I actually got that on sale at Home Depot for about a buck 25 a square foot. And then as we come back up and look at the, some of the other fixtures that we have here, the other items here, you can see here, this mirror here was $50. Uh, this widespread faucet here with the LED light on it, you can see the LED light there, well, that was $90. The vanity light there was $67. The medicine cabinet here was $30. And all of the other parts and everything add up. Remember, you have to buy a bag of thin set. That's about $20 to put down the tile. And then you have to put down grout as well. And that's another $20 bag. And all of the little incidentals and everything just uh, seem to add up here. And so a grand total, we came in right at around $1,200. And remember, that's you doing the work yourself. If you hired somebody to come in and work with you, maybe a friend or somebody, that might add on another couple of hundred dollars. But this is the bare bones minimum that you can get away with doing a bathroom up reasonably decent like this at a reasonable price. $1,200 seems to be from what we've seen in the past with the number of condo flips that we've done. That seems to be about the minimum you can get away with without making it look really, really cheap. And as we, you can see here, we actually made this look like a very classy looking bathroom here. And the only cheap items we had in here was the medicine chest. Am I right where I need to be? And it says REC? Yes. Okay. Well, I hope we've given you inspiration for how to remodel your bathroom at a pretty good budget. And if you like what you saw here on this video, we have plenty more in other categories and other videos on remodeling your bathroom. So be sure and check out those. And while you're here, don't forget, subscribe. Click on that subscribe button down below and then click on the bell icon right next to that. And that will alert you every single time we upload a new video so that you don't miss a single one. So that's it for this time, folks. Thanks for coming by. We do this all for you. And we'll see you on the next one.